Hi everybody, my name is uh, Patrick Donahoe. I'm going to be presenting the introduction into the infinite banking concept. If uh, this is something that you enjoy, it's something that you'd like to learn more about, you can go ahead and visit our website, which is www.paradigmelife.net. Okay. The infinite banking concept was created by a man named uh, Nelson Nash. Nelson Nash also has a website, which is infinitebanking.org. Uh, there is inc an increasing amount of information on the, the Internet. Uh, we do have a, a pretty comprehensive blog. Uh, we have a podcast as well that discusses more in depth how the concept works. So here we go. I think we can all agree that banking is uh, is a very lucrative industry. Obviously, over the last couple of years, banking has has received a pretty bad name, uh, just because of a lot of the the defaults and uh, and then subsequent bank failures. Now, we we can't confuse the uh, the current monetary system and banking system in the United States with the success of banking principles. Uh, but nonetheless, let's kind of get into just how banks operate and uh, why they are as successful uh, as they are. And then we'll tie that into how the infinite banking concept works and how you can replicate similar principles in your own personal finances. So here we go with the banking model. Obviously, banks would not work without depositors. Now, obviously, in our monetary system right now, the Federal Reserve uh, is willing to, to back banks up and allow them to lend actually more money than they have uh, in their reserves. However, uh, without the help of depositors, Okay, banks would not uh, be able to borrow or use any money uh, backed by the Federal Reserve. Now, banks put that money uh, into the banking system. Now, what what do uh, what do banks give in return for these deposits? Now, previously, it was interest. Okay, banks would entice a, a small, uh, relatively small return on on your money. Lately, uh, however, there have been other alternative benefits that banks are providing. And what that does is it allows us to be a little bit more convenient uh, as far as uh, purchasing things, management of our accounts, and so forth. So today, with convenience, we have debit cards instead of having to carry around cash or coin. Uh, we also have online banking where we can do bill pay uh, instead of having to manually write out checks to our uh, electric bill or gas bill uh, or plumber bill, uh, et cetera, cable bills, all the other bills that we have to pay. Um, they also provide us with budgeting tools, uh, automatic savings plans uh, as well. Now, obviously, we have the the safety uh, of the bank that you know money there is a lot lot safer than it is inside of our safe. However, when money gets stored into a bank, uh, it's electronic. There really isn't any type of physical form. And if you look at the current um, dollars and cents, physical dollars and, and cents that are circulating in the economy, uh, it's about 8% of the total money that's circulating in the economy, which is pretty surprising. And if you look at the economics behind that, that is uh, kind of kind of scary. So anyway, money, money goes into the bank's, uh, bank's coffers. The way in which banks make money is through lending. And in that case, they charge interest. Now, in a subsequent video, we're going to show the difference between uh, annual percentage yield and annual percentage rate. And there is some stark differences that most people do not know about. So the bank makes the spread between what they pay and what they earn, correct? All right, so let's do let's do some numbers. Let's assume that uh, during the year you have a thousand dollars on deposit, okay? And it's your average. It's kind of what you keep in there as your buffer. If a bank were to pay you one percent, what would that dollar amount be? It'd be ten bucks, okay? So during the year, banks would pay you ten dollars, okay, on the average balance that you had of $1,000. That can be considered the bank's initial investment in you or what it takes to uh, be able to entice you to keep your money there. So initial investment. Okay. Now interest rates these days are all over the place. We are in some of the lowest interest rate environments in the history of the United States, mainly because the Federal Reserve is trying to stimulate the economy by having individuals borrow. Um, however, they're not being able to force banks to lend, and because of the last couple of years with borrowers um, being uh, as uh, as unscrupulous as can be, 
uh, banks do not want to lend because of fear of having them default as they have done in, in uh, the recent years. Uh, so banks right now have a large amount of money that they can lend uh, but are not. And so it's kind of a, a catch-22 that the Federal Reserve is in. Nonetheless, individuals who are able to acquire loans have very low interest rates. So let's just assume that interest rates range anywhere from 4% to 20% on uh, credit cards. There are some variable mortgages that you can get that are actually below 4%. Okay, so 20% would be um, you know just a regular credit card. I've seen people with 800 credit scores that have uh, APRs on their uh, on their credit cards uh, as high as 20, sometimes higher. Okay, so let's assume that the bank takes this money that they uh, uh, graciously received from you and uh, lend that same thousand dollars to a borrower on a credit card. And let's put that credit card at 10 percent. Okay, so right here we see that the interest rate spread is 9 percent. But let's do what the dollar spread would be. And this is when you're going to start to see how powerful banking is. Okay, that is going to be a $100 interest charge that the bank receives from this $1,000 that goes down and funds the credit card that this borrower is using. Okay, so if it were a 9% spread, the initial investment of the banks would only grow by 90 cents. So as you can see, the interest yield or the gain of money is significantly higher than 9%. Okay, it is 900%. Now, for those of you who are familiar with the fractional reserve, con uh, fractional reserve concept or fractional reserve banking, uh, great place to, uh, to actually see more information on that is a video that's on our YouTube page, which is called Money Banking and the Federal Reserve. So go to youtube.com forward slash paradigm life, para Digum Paradigm Life, okay, and uh, you can watch that video. It's in our favorites section, okay, and it'll give you the history of how, uh, how fractional reserve banking has come to be. So what this means is that the bank is required to keep uh, of its loans 10% on deposit, which means this is at 1,000. So the total loans that a bank can have outstanding is 10,000, which makes the real spread of what the bank could create out of thin air at $9,000. Now, if you take that 9,000, multiply that by 10%, you have $900 that a bank is able to borrow. Okay, or I'm sorry, what a bank is able to lend and borrowers are subsequently able to use. Okay, so let's look at the return there. Now remember, what is the bank out of pocket? Okay, they're out of pocket 10 bucks. $10 to be able to receive a $9,000 profit. Okay, and that is ultimately going to be a whopping 8,900% rate of return. Okay. Now, on top of this, to add some insult to injury, we have to look at other methods that banks receive money uh, money on, which is the account fees that they charge. Um, I have a uh, I have a neighbor, good kid, 23 years old, uh, and is in school, going to be an engineer. But right now, he's working part time at uh, Wells Fargo. So he's living with his parents. And uh, Wells Fargo is, you know, it's all over here in Utah, and he uh, works at one of the smaller branches. In the month of May, Wells Fargo, on its account fees, made just over one hundred thousand dollars. So this is May two thousand and ten. Okay, so a hundred thousand dollars is pretty is pretty good. Probably enough to to uh, to cover their overhead. They don't even need to lend money out at interest. Okay, now who profits from these operations? The owners and the shareholders. Okay, most banks these days are owned, okay, publicly, which means by shareholders. So this is how the banking concept works. Okay, hope you guys have gotten some value out of this. Uh, this is our traditional banking model. The video that's going to come in in conjunction with this one is going to talk about uh, how you can implement these same principles in your own personal finances. So stick with us to the next video. Thanks.